he was offered a lot of things, and if it didn't, if it didn't fit what he wanted, he wouldn't do it. Me and him went on an audition for the head of casting for ABC. Okay, so you got two guys. One that can't act, me, and one that doesn't want to be there, okay? And she's yelling at us. But she's yelling at me, but it's not my fault. I'm trying, he wouldn't take his face out of the copy. And I go, how, how the fuck am I going to connect with a guy that won't look at me? And she threw us out. She says, you know what, you two get out, get the fuck out. And all we did was laugh all the way down the hallway. We just blew an audition for our, a fucking our own sitcom or being on a sitcom. And we just walked away laughing. We're not right for this. We can't do this. And it was so fucking funny. And then we're going down the hallway. These executives were following us. And for some reason, my stomach and I farted real loud, which I don't do that type of... He fell on the floor laughing. When you, when you made Patrice fall on the ground laughing, that was a whole nother level. Here's a guy that would not sell out. He wouldn't fucking sell out. You know what I mean? He was offered a lot of shit, but he knew what he wanted. You know, fucking comics will take, you know, you know, we'll do a fucking cooking show. Like the last comic standing? Yeah, yeah. Hey, Colin. Yeah, oh, look at, are you gonna sit or stand during this? <laughs> <laughs> Repeated the same thing three times. I'm calling cut. Did I repeat it three times? Out. Patrice, not, he said it five times. Okay, but so they can Move cut on. it. All right. Fuck. All right. This is like the seniors tour today. <laughs> Norton, me, and Colin. Uh, where did Colin fly in from? Like obscurity to do this? Yeah. Fucking Colin's gonna turn Patrice's documentary into a one-man show for himself. He stinks. He's the fucking worst. We don't like him. Well, when it came to the dance that Patrice had between wanting to be successful and and wanting to stay true to himself, that's a battle that all the great comedians go through. The extraordinary comedians fight that battle every day. The ordinary comedians just ride the wave. Oh, I should oh the wind's going this way, let me go this way. Oh, they want this kind of material, let me rewrite this for myself. Hey, I got to get a development deal. Let me write seven minutes. Let me write seven minutes with my point of view. And in the end, when you're an artist and you're true to your profession and you're true to your material, the answers come very easily. You are where you are because of your navigational skills as a person. That has nothing to do with your art form. Your art form is genius. But there's people with checkbooks. And whenever somebody writes the fucking check, that means you've got to play the game. You write your own check, you can play your own game. And Patrice was of the feeling, and I actually admire this about him, is like, I just have to stay true to myself, and this is how I am. This is how I'm built. This is how I formed. And accept me the way I am, and don't make me do the dance. Don't make me navigate. Don't make me kiss your ass because you're writing the check. Just hire me and let me do what I do. We were sitting in a conference room and all the executives from uh, Comedy Central were there and, and um, the, all the executives from your company were there. And Patrice just went around the room and basically analyzed in a pretty mean way everyone and who they were. and. He must have nailed it. <laughs> I mean, it, because uh, people had some. There, it, it went on for a really long time, didn't it? Like an hour, he went through, and he, this is who you are, and where you come from, and what you think about, and you know, there was a little bit of like sometimes people would argue back a little bit until they realized this, this doesn't work, this arguing back thing, and then they just sit and take it. But you know, it was kind of funny. It's like, oh, and he kept saying, I don't. I wouldn't get, uh, I wouldn't come here for you guys. You realize that, right? Like, I'm not coming here because of Comedy Central. I'm coming here because of Rich. Because Rich is doing this and he's my friend. And he must have said that like 10 times, like, let him know, like, I would not get out of bed for Comedy Central. And it's not like, what are you doing? You know, he was like, so he was, he just, 
so scared of selling out, you know, he had to make sure that everybody knew that, like, I only do what I want to do. This is not because I'm trying to get on your network. I mean, I think Patrice kind of knew that he was, that he could run circles around people intellectually, and he did a lot of times. You know, he was never afraid of anyone, even, like, when he did those, argued with people on Fox or whatever, he was never worried, ever, that they were going to be able to, like... Um, outsmart him. He just knew. He was just smarter than everyone. I mean, he enjoyed <laughs> being an asshole. But I think he really did think he was a good comedian, which he was. And I think he did think that he, um, I mean, he thought about things for a long time. So I think he knew. He, he had to have known what, how he was or where he fit in the comedy world or in the, the world at large also. I mean, he must have thought about that as much as everything else. So he knew. He's better than you. <laughs> yeah, he also like would stand up the back sometimes when I was doing stand up. He did make me lift my game quite a bit because uh, I was obsessed with, uh, when I started out, I was obsessed with, well, and still am to this day, with black American comedy. And I tried to emulate it. And, uh, and often I would walk off stage looking for approval and he'd be sitting there with his arms folded and judgmentally going, you gonna tell all these white motherfuckers how to get along with black people? <laughs> and stuff that I'd labored over for ages. But it made me uh, lift my game on my uh, point of view. I don't know if he was a genius at split-second analysis or he was a genius at making you believe his split-second analysis. Because let's not mythologize, he was a preposterous individual. But he was so gifted and charismatic at selling you to his... And it was such a unique uh, worldview. Point, uh, point of view and um, also like it's funny now like because I <laughs> because I'm pontificating now and, and uh, being borderline sesquipedalian right, which means using big words unnecessarily well done. great word and uh, but I, I you know how sometimes some people leave a presence behind and I discussed this earlier he leaves a, a, a judgmental asshole presence <laughs> And so there's a certain element of while I'm talking like this, I feel very embarrassed because it's, it's somewhere you can feel him going, look at you fucking pontificating about, shut the fuck up. You. So it's, it's hard to do this without feeling a bit silly. Well, I, I'll say one thing for Patrice and his group of friends. Like, not only are they some of the funniest guys, they're also some of the sweetest, nicest, like, just like, he kept good company. I mean, like. From, you know, Robert Kelly to Bill Burr to Norton to Colin to, you know, Voss and Keith and all those guys. I mean, like, they were like a crew, you know. They were kind of like the Ocean's Eleven, but without the success. You know what I'm saying? Like, they didn't make any movies or anything. And they, um, they definitely, um, you know, I think that they, they got it. Like, they enjoyed the hang. And um, I would say that the shitting on it is just uh, love turned upside down. All that kind of, you know, verbal hate. But really, at the end of the day, it's really just, um, you know, thinking on your feet, being quick, and also being thick-skinned. And, like, Patrice, I think, was the, a master at it. You know, and we all think that we're, we're okay at it. And then you meet him, and you realize that you're not that good at it at all. And, uh, you know, <laughs> although I do remember one thing that I thought was hilarious about him, because I did see him, like, you know, just, uh, like, totally uh, do his thing, you know, of, like, you know, gutting somebody, you know, where he just basically... And then I said, hey, do you want a drink? And he got like um, the girliest, sweetest drink I've ever seen in my life. It was like one of those like, can I get a Jamba Juice daiquiri with a, like a unicorn, um, you know, hair in it? And like, I was like, what? And then you realize you're like, mm, well, that's just how it is. You know, he's sweet and evil at the same time. <laughs> he's sweet evil. Sweet evil. I think if Patrice was alive today, he would never stop throwing up. Because the apologists out there, the blogs, the, the fact that you can't say anything without being ripped apart because no one understands what comedy is anymore. I'd be interested to see how he would be handling that right now because I actually think that he's the champion that the comedy world needs right now because everyone apologizes for themselves now. Everyone walks on stage and doesn't, doesn't ex people don't do the exact set that they want to do anymore because they're so conscious over the repercussions. And I think Patrice's indifference 
to the other 50% <laughs> is something that is, again, what made him special, but six years ago, five years ago, wasn't as needed. And now that energy of not caring would have been unbelievably valuable. I mean, I genuinely think that he is the f best comedian in history. I don't think so. It's like, it's high, it's <laughs> like that. It goes up, <laughs> like that, like a, it's really, it's a high pitch to come from a guy that's so big and tall. So you go, that's already, that's unique in itself. This dude is choking an elephant, but it's, yeah, but so it was, it was high. And when he laughed, you knew it was funny. Cause he didn't laugh when that shit wasn't funny. So if you got that, he was doing good. Or if he did that, he was having a good time on stage. And he was about sneakers. You know, he knew, he knew how niggas thought versus how regular black guys thought. He knew how white dudes thought versus, you know, he knew, like, you couldn't get by him. You can't trick a trickster. Like, he knew. Like, he knows. He said, I got a PhD in white people, man. I'm from Boston. Like, that's, that's, that's real stuff. He was just cultured. The dude just knew. He was good. We, lose, we lost a voice, man. A real voice in comedy. Because I remember the funeral. Everybody was there. Every comedian you could think of was there. Because they know. Ain't nobody like this guy. There's nobody like him. And now we lost him. So now we got to cope. So now we got to tell jokes to help us out. But he was the jokes that helped us out. Where the fuck we getting our help at? You know, so it was like, it was a blow. It's like you, you're, going, you, you're driving forward doing 90, and then somebody throws a car in reverse. And you just flip and tumble. And that's what it was, because uh, I see why Patrice was great. And I see why so many people loved it. And I was like, dang, that's, that is a, well, comedy's supposed to be fun, right? And that shit hurt. It was a bunch of clowns crying that day. So it was like, oh, man. Yeah, so I was hurt. I was, uh, I felt like, um, I felt like, uh, I guess the comedy guys cheated me of a fully New York experience. That bitch is the worst person. Do you remember her? I remember. Holy shit. What an awful human being. Uh, we had a pitch me once and we went in and we were sitting down there and they had this like, this, this woman, I forget her name, but anyway, she was like obviously exec, CEO, head of the seniors, VPs, all that. And it was a meeting with her and her henchmen and everyone was in there and everyone was nervous and she had like this really cold like demeanor and everyone was just like yes mamming her and like she and Patrice was just like so grossed out by the environment and she asked him a question and his only retort was just like when is the last time your husband ate your pussy and she was just it just caught him so off guard and like all of us just like I'm in a pitch meeting trying to sell a show and I'm like what the fuck are you doing and he just and he and she was just like you cannot talk to me like that and he was like when is the last time your husband ate your pussy and like he would continue he's like let me tell you the last time my girlfriend licked my balls. And he, and he would tell that. And then finally she would like, you know, he hasn't done it in like two months. And like that, whatever perch she was on in that meeting, whatever leverage she had, she got brought right down to everyone else's relatable pussy eating fucking level that we're all on. And all of a sudden we weren't scared of her. Like we had, an, everyone felt like natural and ideas flourished. And he had an environment where like, this is the type of like, Here's what I'm trying to pitch. And then, like, she, she listened to us. You know what I mean? And her little henchman finally, like, ooh, oh, you know, what if we do this? What if we do that? And everyone had, like, this great, it was a great, it was one of the greatest meetings I've ever been a part of. And after that, one of the, the senior VPs was like, this is the first time I've ever spoken in one of those meetings. And she kind of, like, thanked him, like, for actually, like, opening those doors. So, yeah, he pushed the boundaries, but there was always, there was an angle every time. It wasn't just to see, like, oh, I wonder how this person's going to react to me using the word cunt. It wasn't. It was never that. He always had purpose to it. You'll hear a lot of comics say, like, with certain situations, political or pop culture, um, like, I wish Patrice was around. So I would want to hear, what do you say about this? In certain situations, like, what would Patrice say about this? What would Patrice say about this Caitlyn Jenner situation? What would Patrice say about this going on? And so, yeah, it's just, you just miss his perspective and, and insight and just, you know, as yeah, just uh, what he thought about things. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big loss, man. So when you heard he died, uh, what? any emotions there? No, man, I'm dead inside. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that about you, but I wanted to hear you say it. <laughs> no, it was upsetting, man. It was, uh, yeah, it was just, 
it's, it's, it was tough, man. Yeah. We be on the road and we go to a Chinese restaurant, and he would order like eight things off the menu, like his own little small buffet. He wouldn't eat it all, but he just like to taste it at least. He would just go, oh, yeah, yeah his own buffet at the table, and <laughs> and that was it. I one time we went to Subway and he ordered a foot long, a six, six inch, and a soup. And, uh, I was like, uh, he didn't eat all of the six inch. I did. I ate the rest of the six inch, but. He never finished all that stuff he ordered, but he just wanted it there just in case, I guess. Just in case eating. I've never done that. He tried. I'm trying to quit smoking cigarettes, but hey, you know, you try. You try to stay healthy, but you know, you got, you know, that's life. You know, you have, he used to always uh, talk about me uh, smoking cigarettes and he would actually get upset. But then finally he went, you know what? I understand an addiction because I have one. So he, he he can have compassion for a person, especially for when he was so smart, and he just understood what addiction was, and is. One day I was on the road with him, and um, I walked to this hotel room, and it was a table full of pills. I was like, ugh, this is, this is, this is, my grandmother got stuff like this, and she 80, so that's when I kind of knew. But we never really talked about it. I thought Patrice was as strong as a fucking ox. I didn't think anything could hurt him. I didn't get to see him, but I didn't really want to see him in that condition. But I knew that's what you do when someone's in the, in the hospital, you go see him. But I didn't want to see some the guy that's strong as an ox laying in the bed with tubes and shit. And then when you heard he had passed, where, where were you then? I was home in bed. And what were you thinking? remember. What do you, what do you miss about Patrice? His insightfulness. Um, no matter what point of view you had, he always had another one and probably a more interesting one. Patrice definitely put some fear in people when he talked to them this on a one-on-one -on -one thing because he was like a mirror to them. He, but he made, he knew how to make them see themselves in him and then look at themselves. And people don't want to look into themselves. People don't want to, definitely not in the middle of the day or if you're at a comedy club somewhere, you don't really want to see you. You want to avoid you. And Patrice was a master at making you see you. That's why, that's exactly why people love or hate Patrice because they love or hate themselves. And we know when we hate ourselves. We know when we look at ourselves like, look at you, you're nothing. How could anyone fuck you? Just a mirror in tears. <laughs> he would come on the show and hold court. I would say it was almost an easier day when he was in because you didn't have to work so hard because he was there and it was just, he was great. But you, were, you wanted to work harder. You wanted to impress him. You, you know, you, you couldn't just sit there and be lazy. First of all, he'll call your ass on it in a second. Being able to talk to him about any topic and get such a unique viewpoint on what he was talking about, to me, was uh, really special, really cool. Making Patrice laugh to me was, holy shit, that was the thing to do. And uh, just that big booming high wah, laugh would come out. And you knew, you know, all right, I could clock out. <laughs> done. My job here is done. That's how one in a billion this guy was. People like Patrice are missed the most when so much is going on that you want to talk about. I need to know what he would have thought. And to think that you would know, nah. That was what was special about us. You know, Anthony, Patrice would have, and then they tweet something, you're like, you asshole if you even think for a second that you know what patrice would have said or done or anything shut the fuck then you didn't know him at all his funerals was one of the best time of my lives that's how and all the comics came there like that like we're gonna have fun at this funeral i've been to weddings that weren't better i've been to mansion parties that weren't better like his coffin is in there and we just wanted to find a room in the back so we could just talk shit to each other out of respect for this moment. This is how you, you want to disrespect this guy by crying. Chris Rock is back there. Kev, I saw Kev and Burr. I said, 
we're supposed to be in the back. We go in this room in the back, and all these people are grieving. It's like, fuck that. And we just trashed each other. Just everybody just going at each other. And then the funeral was fucking funny. It was better than shows I'd been to. Like, it should be a short, this Montreal Comedy Festival. You know? And, and that's how it ended. No tears, just fucking laughter. And that's what I'm, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the funeral, at the funeral is when I found out Patrice was cheating on me. Because I thought I was the only one that he gave great advice to. Everybody went up there and was like, he's the only person that I could talk to. And I said, I said, I thought I was special. Go fuck yourself, Patrice. Everybody's saying he was my best friend. It's hilarious. He had so many best friends. Or he, he conned everybody to think he was his best friend and shit. But yeah, that's it, man. It was, it was, it was fun, man. It was just fun knowing him. Like, like some people say, well, you, you should have ate better. And he died too soon. He lived more than people that's going to live longer. So fuck it. I've been around for a long time. And I only met one Patrice. And the, the thing was, I learned how to think different, how to be honest, and how important that is. I'm still working on being honest, but these are just really important things you need to see somebody do for you to realize how important they are to do. And, and th these are things that will stay with me for the rest of my life. They'll make me a better person when I run into other people. It's like, there's no fucking reason to cry. This is, you, you were lucky. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you were lucky. So then as I, I decided not to cry. This is ridiculous. I, I feel bad for the people that didn't meet him. Comics don't usually have gravitas, but I would say Patrice is one of those people who had a, a serious comedy viewpoint. I mean, even shows like The Nasty Show in Montreal, they always put it, no one could follow Patrice. So you'd see a show, you'd be crying with laughter, and Patrice would top them with stuff that you'd never hear. And it was the, his, the manner of his delivery. It might have been filthy, but it was always delivered with such a twinkle in his eye. It's such a wonderful twinkle that you knew you didn't take any of this seriously. And I think that was it. He had this strong comedic voice that had gravitas. And that's why they loved him. He, you know, he, and of course, his sheer size. No one would dare. I don't think I ever heard him being heckled. I never heard Patrice being heckled once. But I knew he'd be able to deal with it really well. And that was a shame. I never saw him rip, rip someone apart. But I think it was a real shame. It was a real... Um, I'm sure you've heard everyone say it, but it was a, it was a real moment where... People cried. So I don't want to get too emotional, but I get very upset when I think about it. What, uh, what legacy do you think Patrice has left us? Sorry, I don't know why. Sorry, please. I'm sorry. I never thought I'd get emotional about Patrice. <laughs> I never get emotional about anyone. Most comics are fucking douchebags, most of them, and he's... I actually knew Patrice through the time of him going from, like, standing up to sitting down, doing comedy. And what I thought that brought to his comedy was, like, you know, and he'd go, he wouldn't even sit, like, to the front of the stage. He always kind of picked, like, a back corner and would almost, like, you know, lean back and he'd leave his jacket on if it was cold out. You know, he didn't really take his jacket off. And he would just, uh, I thought it was a lot more inviting and with his kind of slow pace and everything that would draw them into him and I found that so intriguing and I wanted to do that too I wanted to make the crowd come to me rather than going to them and I've always found that works out much better for me um, and that was all inspired by him completely because yeah I'd watch him at the comic strip very specifically I remember was where I first started noticing he started sitting down most of his sets and just taking his time if the crowd was talkative when he first got on stage he would just sit there and like he would really wait for it to just kind of unravel you know more than, than than killing with laughter you know any shitty comic has killed with laughter before which the crowd was great or overstimulated and they're just firing and you're just hitting everything but it was always interesting to me to see a crowd that when you first got up there they were, you were almost like a second thought and then that moment where you can realize, uh, it's, again, it's not the laughs, it's the pin drop silence. <laughs> <laughs> the pin, that, was a, that was a large pin. The pin drop silence that would be in a room, like you know, especially if you're doing a joke joke, once you have that pin drop silence, you know the punchline's going to hit. It's the amazing part is getting them from, like, you know, not fully on board, not fully paying attention. It's late. And they're just losing steam. And for him to capture them back to complete full attention, 
I always love that. That's why I, for that reason, that's why I've always like kind of put in to go like towards at the end of shows last, because that's the challenge of it, and that's what creates that comfort level. No one's ever called me for like uh, ripping off Patrice, even though I sit on a stool and I do all, you know I, all these things that I've mimicked that I've watched him do that I wanted to do. You sit out because Patrice said that. No one's ever said that, and I'm always like, if someone ever called me, I'd say, yeah, yeah, that's exactly why. Watching him do that is what made me want to do that. People thought that he hated women. He loved women. What he hated was how weak men were around women, especially beautiful women. Men give up all their power. It's amazing that any men get women at all, because most of them don't know what to say to women. Uh, Patrice had a well-thought-out philosophy about women, as did I. I spent many years, and I have an affinity for women, and I really respect them. I used to bring girls on the show. When we did the show, I would bring models up to the show, and he would deconstruct them. He would take away their power, but I would warn them before they come on. I'd be like, when you meet Patrice, he's going to look real scary, but he's not, and he's going to say shit to you. Just go with it. So we had similar goals, both in, in meeting women, the goal was to meet them and make them comfortable enough to be with you. But how we got there was very divergent. And so he appreciated my approach and I appreciated his approach. Patrice's history with the roasts in general was interesting. If I got involved in the booking, I would always say to Patrice, we're roasting this one, we're roasting that one, we could really use you. You'd be great at it. And he'd say, I only want to roast people I know. So he turned me down quite a few times and finally it got to the Charlie Sheen roast and we were getting closer and closer and Charlie Sheen was a tricky booking I mean not he's a polarizing figure winning Tiger Blood the hookers the porn stars it was like roasting in a UFC world and I called Patrice and I'm like we want you we need somebody big and real. And he took it, to his credit. He didn't have a lot of notice. He only had about a week or so. And then that day came, and I'm on the red carpet doing my interviews, and I look to my right, and boom, Patrice is there. And then he says, I don't like the material. And, oh, these guys wrote it for me, they don't know. I'm like, those are the best writers that you could get for a roast. If you don't like it, then you're never gonna like it. This is me and him talking three inches from each other whispering. I said, fuck the material, get a pen if you need it, and a piece of paper, and sit in the back and roast the roast. Just be you and roast the roast. That's what you do at the end. You batting clean up now. And he smiled. He did that big smile and he pulled me in and he fucking hugged me and he did it. It made me so happy. He went up at the end he called William Shatner a racist. He called Mike Tyson scary, uh, or not scary enough anymore. And, you know, he called me a legend that he's never seen the legendness of. He just fucking killed me and everybody else. He roasted the roast. And he made a real splash. Not a, uh, he made a fucking tsunami of a splash that night. That was it. He really nailed it that night. And he did it his way. Patrice really, like, studied white people, okay? Like, uh, the way white people study sharks, he would study white people. i never seen a guy that knew. It was really, he was, he's like black Jesus almost. Like the, <laughs> He just really knew, just like the ins and outs, and he knew how to translate a lot of things to, like, white ears. So there'd be a lot of conflicts people would tend to make into a racial thing that he would, he would take that element out of it. And he'd make it more of a bat, like he would look at it more of like a gender thing or a. Uh, he was really good at, make, at taking situations out of that that context, like a racial thing, and like, and if they were in that context, explaining it. And um, it, it, make, it makes me laugh because when I think of whenever somebody get mad at him and snap, and I saw this happen a lot when somebody would snap, they'd either get mad and call him a racial word, or they would uh, call him a gorilla. Because it's kind of hard to make fun of him because he was a funny guy. Like for the roast the last time I saw him. It was hard to write jokes, whatever. I had one joke that, uh, why is Mike Tyson's mother here? That was like one of the, one of the few I could come up with to like get him. And everything else is like people could call him King Kong or something, right? Yeah, that's all you could really make fun of him on. Some people just call him a gorilla, but it makes me laugh because 
when I think about it, he was almost like everybody else was a gorilla and he was the Jane Goodall, like studying, you know, like, like don't look at these gorillas in the eyes, they get upset. Like he was the one studying gorillas for, for all the map people would say some mean shit to him. He was really the scientist of it, you know, and, and everybody else was, was kind of the, the monkey that he was observing. I, it was like a known a philosopher, yeah. I mean, that guy really sticks out in my mind to this. And I seriously f probably think about him e like every day or every other day. I, I it, like, I, it's amazing how much I think about Patrice. You know, he was gentle. He was a gentle guy. He wasn't, the, he, again, he was loud and funny, but he wasn't a bully. He, people thought he bullied them because he made fun of them, but he also made fun of the biggest guy in the room. Like that's the first guy he'd go after, the executive, the guy who could knock his teeth out. Patrice did not find smaller targets and just make fun of them. He made fun of them, but he would literally go after the bigger, stronger guy first. Um, so he was not a bully. He was an equal opportunity assassin. Um, and people who were smaller than him or who couldn't hit back as hard felt like he was a bully, but you didn't know him well enough. And, and, he, and he was a guy that was, he was so good to talk to. Um, because again, when it was just you and him and you were, he was so insightful and he always had such helpful things to say, uh, about relationships and about, uh, you know, he was always like, I remember when I was dating a girl and she had, I think we were breaking up and he, he was like, you know, there's only one of you. There's a lot of her. Yeah, um, and he had smart things to say. And I, I knew in that moment that he was just making me feel better. And that kind of moved me too. It wasn't like I was 100%. Like, he almost insulted her so much in my defense that I was like, well, you know, I mean, she's our... <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I had to go to bat for her just in case I got back with her, which I did. But uh, he got very defensive for me in that moment, um, and that moved me.